Okay, I love this presentation. This is one of my favorites. So tonight I want to talk about how ancient cultures view the universe, but I also want to show you how modern people do this. Um, we have an observatory in Seashell, and I was there two years ago and doing an observing session. I noticed out on the deck there was some people that were busy observing the sky, and one of them, Bruce Fryer, whose wife Grace is here tonight, uh, he's the president of our center currently, and he was pretty intently staring at the northern sky. So I, when I had a break in the activity, I went over to see him and I said, what are you looking at? And he was looking up over the roof of the observatory at the northern sky and he went, that's not a bear. And obviously he's looking at Ursa Major and I went, well, if it isn't a bear, what is it? And he said, it's a rat. I mean, look at it, that's a rat. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, we know that the stars have moved. It probably looked more like a bear in the past. And here's what I mean. This is a time lapse going from 100,000 years be before Common Era to 100,000 after. And you can see how the stars in the Big Dipper are moving. And all of the stars in the sky have velocities. They all move. I'll show you Orion and Leo. This is speeded up a bit. But you see how those stars are all moving. Here is a map that was carved into stone in Korea, depicting a map from 600 uh, before Common Era. And this map no longer matches the patterns of stars in the sky because they move. So if what you're hoping to do is go out and look at the sky and see exactly the same thing that your very ancient ancestors saw, it's not going to happen. In fact, if you go back 30,000 years, the North Star, Polaris, wasn't the North Star, it was Vega, because the Earth, like a top, it wobbles. And it'll come back to Vega eventually. So that's one thing I want you to keep in mind tonight. Another thing I want to tell you about, we were talking a moment ago about a constellation, Ursa Major, but what a lot of cultures use is asterisms. And what an asterism is, is a small group of bright stars. And you can see an example here that everybody learned in elementary school, the Big Dipper or the Plow or the Wayne, whatever you want to call it, points at the, the North Star. So if you hear me talking about asterisms, that's what I'm talking about. Some cultures don't use constellations at all. You will see this shortly. So if we're talking about the constellations that we're all familiar with in the Western world, we're talking about 48 Ptolemaic constellations. There's Ptolemy down in the corner there. We'll get back to him. And you can see this is a snapshot of the culture that he lived in. You can see the animals that they were familiar with. You can see mythological figures and heroes and heroines. You can see their scientific instrument, which is a triangle. They gave us trigonometry, right? So this is kind of a snapshot of the, the world that he had at that time. Now, in 1922, Western white colonial scientists decided we need constellations in the southern sky, and they added 40 constellations to create what is now used by astronomers all over the world. It's called the standard constellations. And you can see this is a snapshot of 1920s culture. You can see a sextant there and a, and a clock and a water pump and a microscope and a telescope and a sailing ship. And, but here's the thing, there were people living in that part of the world and they didn't go to them and say, so, hey, what constellations do you have? They it just basically assumed you guys are a bunch of ignorant savages, but we're gonna do you a favor and give you constellations. We'll get more into that in a minute. Here's another thing I want you to take into consideration, 7,000 world languages. And in your children's lifetime, half will probably disappear. And you may say to yourself, well, okay, thank you. And another language, that's still thank you, right? What difference does it make? I mean, a number of years ago, someone created Esperanto, hoping this would be a world language, and it never took hold. Cultures are foundations of knowledge and language. And key concepts and ways of seeing the world will disappear with those languages. And this relates to the difficulty in translating words accurately into other languages. My favorite example is this word, Kanoa. That's New Zealand, beautiful country. 
And this is from the Maori Iwi, the Maori nations. And it translates as land, country, ground, terrain, and placenta. Let that sink in for a second. The land that nourishes me, the land that gave me birth. You see them, there's other meanings that are embedded in these things. So let's look at the Maori view of the sky. The Maori Iwi used the night sky in a manner similar to the Polynesians, but different enough to warrant its own sky culture. The maritime themes are central to the Maori culture were used extensively in nautical navigation. And along with most other cultures, the rising and setting of prominent stars were used to signal planting and harvesting seasons. So here is the Maori sky. There is Orion. There is that triangular formation stars called the Hyades cluster, which is the head of Taurus, the bull. And there's the Pleiades cluster, but not if you're Maori. If you're Maori, the Pleiades cluster is the foam at the front of Tainui's boat. That triangular bunch of stars, the Hyades cluster is the sail, and the three stars in the belt of Orion is the glittering waters going off the back of the boat. You see in this slide here, I've given everything its Maori name, and every single one of them translates as something to do with navigation. There's the standard southern sky that I just talked about that they gifted to southern people. There's the Maori sky, same piece of sky. There's the great boat of Tama Roretti, who's a great warrior in Maori stories. The Tara Otewaka o Tama Toretti, which is the rope of Tama Roretti's canoe, or the rope of the Teponga. What's the Teponga? The Taki Otahi, the Southern Cross, sometimes called the Teponga, which means the anchor. And over there, Atu Tahi, that's an opus. So we've already learned the cultures around the user, uh, around the sky or uh, the world are using the sky as a calendar. I mean, they didn't have printed material in some of these cultures. You didn't have something to put on the wall. If you wanted to know it was time to plant, you went out and looked up. It was a divination system. It was a navigational tool. And it was a place to honor the gods, the ancestors, and their culture. So my objective tonight is to show you these different perspectives and to show you that there was ancient science and to inspire you. So here we go. The way I want to do this is I'm going to show you two segments of sky. One is the sky at winter solstice. This is what it looks like from our seashell observatory. And there's Orion and there's Taurus, the uh, Hyades cluster, that triangle. And there's the Pleiades and there's the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. And I'm going to show you the summer salt of the sky. And there down in the corner there on the southern horizon from the seashell observatory, you got the teapot. Yes, it's Sagittarius, who is supposed to be an archer. But every single one of us amateur astronomers call that teapot. And the steam coming out of the spout of that teapot is a Milky Way. And next to it is this, Scorpius, with that very distinct three star lines there. The brightest star is Vega, OK? So the earliest sky that we know of, according to the paleontologist, was found in a cave in Armense in Spain. It's dated between 12,000 and 15 or 14,500 years old. And it depicts a number of animals on the ceiling of the cave. And they are certain that it is representing a piece of the Milky Way. And we, of course, don't know what they call these constellations because we don't know anything about their language, but we do know that these were the creatures that they pictured there. And there's the teapot down in the corner just to give you an idea of what part of the sky we're looking at, right along the Milky Way. So a culture we do know about is the Egyptians. And the Egyptians had Bakiu, which the Greeks called Dekans. 36 groups of stars, asterisms, not constellations, rising consecutively on the horizon, Throughout each Earth rotation, the rising of each Bakiu or Deccan marked the beginning of a new hour or Deccanal of the night. And they were used as a sidereal clock beginning by at least the 9th or 10th dynasty. So that's about 2100 BCE. And because a new Deccan also appears every 10 days in the eastern sky at dawn right before the sun rises, the ancient Greeks called them Deccanoi, which means tents. Now, the late Egyptian sky is very closely related to Greco-Roman culture, astronomy, and astrology. 
but the constellation names varied. So for example, Cancer the Crab is the scarab beetle and the figure of the lion near the scales in this diagram here is not Leo from our constellations, it's the constellation Centaurus. So there is the ancient Egyptian sky and there is the teapot, but you see they don't even notice it, the sky, but there is Scorpius, but it's the prow of a boat. And you've got a hippopotamus, a crocodile, a mooring post, you've got a boat, you've got a canoe fish in the net, all sorts of stuff that they'd see in their culture. The winter sky there is Orion, but you see the three stars that we recognize as the belt are three jewels in an Egyptian crown on an even larger thing. There's the Hyades cluster, it's the jaw, there's the flock, which is the Pleiades. Now the Babylonians, Another ancient culture, they preserve an almost a canonical state dating back to the 12th century BCE. The earliest fragment known in their records is from the 7th century, but the celestial data in the text suggests a much earlier origin of the observational base, probably between 1350 and 1150 BCE. And there are two principal tablets called Mulapin. The first has a star catalog with a list of names of stars and constellations, three lists of heliacal risings and settings, Zipu, which are culminating asterisms, uh, constellations, and a list of constellations in the lunar path, which they describe in the uh, tablet as gods who stand in the path of the moon through whose region the moon during a month passes repeatedly and keeps touching them. This is an early zodiac. The second tablet has rules for the calendar. It has rules for the sundial. It has rules for omia, which is relations between gods and the celestial bodies. In the Seleucid Babylonian culture, which came later, this is the era of the successors of Alexander the Great, who conquered Babylon in 331 BCE. And by this time, Malapin was a thousand years old, but it was considered old fashioned, but still current. It was in use. So here's an ancient Babylonian sky, and you can see there is Orion, and he's the sh true shepherd of Anu. And there's what's going to become Taurus, the bull of heaven, and there's the star cluster, the seven gods, which becomes the Pleiades. But look over here, you've also got two sets of twins, the great little twins, that's going to become Gemini eventually. And if you go to the Seleucid sky, there it is, because you got that Greek influence. If we look at the summer sky, there's the teapot down there, and it's part of the god Pavel saying, there's the scorpion. It's already becoming a scorpion in their sky. If you go to the Seleucid version, it looks very, very similar. But you notice they've added this goddess over here. Now, along comes Hipparchus of Nicaea, who is a Greek astronomer, geographer, a mathematician. He was the founder of trigonometry and discovered the precession of the equinoxes. He made use of observations and maybe the mathematic, mathematical techniques accumulated over centuries by the Babylonians and Meton of Athens, Timacharis, Aristotle, a whole bunch of other Greek scientists. And he may have been the first to develop a reliable method to predict solar eclipses. And it was him that compiled the first comprehensive star catalog of the Western world. Then we get Ptolemy who I mentioned right at the beginning. Greek astronomer, 100 to 178 CE in Alexandria, Egypt. He collected descriptions of 1,022 stars in his great system of astronomy. He was the one that created those 48 constellations we mentioned in the beginning, based on Greek or Roman mythology with estimates of their brightness, based largely on the observations of Hipparchus. And his book was translated twice into Arabic in the ninth century under its shortened Arabic title, the Almagest, which means the largest book. Hang on to that thought. So what happens eventually is all of these invasions in Europe basically completely overturn everything and, and send everyone into a dark ages where a lot of this knowledge is lost. Fortunately, we got these guys. The Arab scientists were the principal astronomers between the 8th and the 11th century, and many of the Arabic language star descriptions in the Almagest came to be used widely today as names for stars. One of the principal astronomers was Abu al Hassan al-Rahman al-Sufi, and al-Sufi produced 
a revised and updated version of the Alma Guest, which he called the Kitab Sur al Kawakib, or Book of Fixed Stars, in 964 CE. It listed the Arabs' own star names, magnitudes determined by Al Sufi himself, two drawings of each constellation, one is seen in the sky, and one reverse is if you've gone off into space and you're looking back through the constellation towards the ground, which is kind of clever. There's an example right there in this book. So, what you're dealing with when you look at the sky, a modern sky now, is Arab star names for all the brightest stars, the ones you see with the naked eye. Most are related to their constellation. For example, the star of Deneb means the tail, and it's part of the constellation Sigma Cis One. Some describe the star Sirius, which translates literally as scorching, and that is the brightest star in the sky. Many bear the Arab prefix Al, which means the, so Al Gal is the ghoul. And over time, some translators omitted this prefix and hence several star names of Arabic origin are given elsewhere with or without that prefix. Some were corrupted when Arabic texts were translated into Latin beginning from the 12th century and sometimes extremely. But this often changed the meaning or left the name meaningless. Other names were mistakenly transferred from one star to another so that the name might even refer to a different constellation, Greek or Arabic rather to than to the one of the star's actual residence. A, a modern example is Betelgeuse, which is that variable star, which is the right shoulder of, of the constellation Orion. Nobody knows how it's supposed to be spelled or even pronounced because it's a corruption. We've lost the meaning. Local Arab tribes had their own names for bright stars like Aldebaran, and they commonly regarded single stars as representing animals or people. So Alpha and Beta Ophiuchi were regarded as a shepherd and his dog, while neighboring stars made up the outlines of a field with sheep. Some Arabic names were already so many centuries old that their meanings were lost even to Al Sufi, and so they remain unknown today. And other star names used by Al Sufi and his compatriots were direct translations of Ptolemy's descriptions. So the star Fomahat means from the mouth of the southern fish, and that's where Ptolemy had described it in the Almagest. So there's the Big Dipper. You see, there's all the stars with their. Arabic names we use to this day. So the Almagest shows a sky which is basically very similar to Ptolemy's. There's the teapot, that's the arches, there's the scorpion, there's the winter sky, there's Orion. So it looks something like this. Very, very similar to what you'd see if you were looking at a Ptolemaic sky. But they also had moon stations, 28 positions defining the daily location of the moon, the time of the station begins when the stars start to rise before the sun. 13 to 14 days per station. One of the stations has 14 days because we have 365 days in the year. Each station is recognized by a star or a group of stars. And the system served as an agricultural, meteorological, and health calendar. So there's Arabic moon stations. And there's the teapot, which has now become the ostriches. And there's the scorpion sting, which is part of the moon stations. For the winter sky, there's Orion and, and the shoulder side of Al Chow, so that's Betelgeuse that I told you about a minute ago, is part of that. There and there, there's the Hyades and the Pleiades. But you know what? There were other constellations in Europe. The Macedonians had them, ethno astronomical research among Macedonians in 1982 was organized by a, the planetarium and a youth cultural center. And about 140 villages in the Republic of Macedonia were visited and 1,500 inhabitants interviewed and surveyed. And this is what you get, okay? Down there, that's the Big Dipper, and it's a group of thieves. And up there, there's the brightest star um, right there, Vega, but it's become part of a trivet and tongs. And the uh, constellation of the swan, Cygnus, is, is an auger and is a plow. If you look at the winter sky, Orion down here has become a plowman, an oxen, and a plow, and a scale, and there's all kinds of interesting things going on here. There's the Hyades, it's a fox and pigs, and there's a mother hen that's the Pleiades. The Romanians had this too. They had pre-Christian ancestral agricultural stuff, <laughs> Christian influences. <clears throat> They had Romanian history in their sky. And there's a whole bunch of stuff overlapping when we look at Orion. So there I've sort of backed off so you can see the whole 
winter sky. There's Orion down there. We're going to zoom in on that in a minute because there's a whole bunch of stuff overlapping. But you see there are animals from their culture. There's the great chariot, which is the Big Dipper, the side, the little chariot. Carps, whales, dragons, turtle doves. There's a close-up of um, Orion there. You see it's depending on which part of the country you're, you're in. It's the three saints, it's the great auger, it's the little plow, it's a sickle, and all kinds of interesting stuff going on here. Summer sky, you see all kinds of other interesting things. There's the teapot. It's still an archer, there's still a scorpion in the sky, but there's all kinds of other things that are different. The Sardinians, they had their own version of the sky. Up there, there's Orion, but it's the three Moreas, or the sticks. And you see the Big Dippers become the seven brothers. There's the Hyades, it's the hut. And the Pleiades is a bunch. Summer sky, you see they've got a cross of St. Constantine. There's the brightest star, Vega there. Now, let's do something a, a little bit different. Here's, but related, this is the Indian or Vedic view of the sky. And they have something they call Rashi. This is a sidereal zodiac of 360 degrees, like a tropical zodiac, divided into 12 equal parts, and each 12, 30 degrees, is called a sign or a Rashi. And they use two systems for measuring time. One is a lunar calendar, one is solar, which can get really confusing. In both cases, one year is divided into 12 months or Masha. And the name of the solar months originated from the constellations names. Here it is here. And you see they've got a leap month jammed in there. So if you look at this diagram, you can see the constellations that you are probably familiar with in the zodiac with their Indian names next to them, but they have something called nakshatra. The ecliptic is divided into 27 parts with 13 degrees and 20 minutes in each, connected with 27 asterisms known as the nakshatras. Some of the early versions have 28. They were used for timing rituals and determining birth lunar mentions. The names of the lunar months originated from those 12 division names, which a full moon or a purnima occurs. Unlike a solar day, which goes from sunrise to sunrise, a lunar day or a moon's position in a nakshatra does not depend on the sun rising or the moon rising. So a lunar day could start at any time of a solar day. That's why this can get really confusing. Vedic people mostly used lunar months, adding another month every 32.5 months on average to correct the mismatch between the lunar, lunar and solar year. So here you have the nakshatra. And you can see right there is the teapot, but they're not really using it here. And there is the winter sky. And there's Orion, but they're just using the stars right at the top there for that. There is the Pieties. There is the Pleiades. So now let's go way around the world to a different place. And let's talk about Hawaiian wayfinding. And this is related to that. Maori stuff I told you about earlier. Hawaiian star lines, this is knowledge passed down orally for many generations, suppressed by white colonial rulers, and eventually lost. And then the Polynesian Voyage Society, or PVS, from 1973, created Hokulea, which is a boat. Now, Hokulea is a traditional Hawaiian voyaging canoe with a mission to revive the art of wayfinding. And they got a hold of Nainoa Thompson, current president of the PVS, and he found Mal Pelio, a native of Sadawal, Micronesia, who was a master navigator and wayfinder. And he brought him to Hawaii to teach them the, the knowledge, and with his help, they recovered the Hawaiian star compass and the star lines. Each star line is a group of main stars. The stars connect making constellations. Navigators remember the rising and setting houses of these stars, the stars that connect in each line, and the lines that point directly to north and south. The star line's position in the night sky slowly change over time, so each star line is more prevalent at night and according to the season. So here's the four star lines. Now let's go through them one at a time. So the first one is called Keika o Makali'i, or the Baler of Makali'i. It's shaped as a canoe baler. Now this guy is like that ancient Mari sky. It has 
all ha has to do with navigation and, and uh, making way across the ocean. So the Baylor scoops up Orion and the Pleiades into the night sky. And the main stars from north to south are Hokule, which is Capella, Nanamua, which is Castor, Nanahope, which is Pollux, Poana, which is Poseidon, and Aa, which is Sirius. Mintaka, which is this star here, the third star in the, in the belt of what we would call Orion, is important because it rises and sets directly east or west, giving the navigator an easy, easy pointer star for direction. Uh, the star Mirzim, using the Arab name, uh, next to Aa, which is Sirius, and uh, Canopus connect together to create a southern pointer, which you see here. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce these two Hawaiian names, Ma Ma Mahasim and Menkalinen, which are the Arab names. There is your northern pointer. Now, why would you need two pointers in the constellation? Because if the constellation is rising or setting, you may only see half of the constellation. So you need pointers at either end to give you that north-south directional line. The next one is the boneback lizard, Iwikamo, and it's depicted as the backbone of a lizard or mo'o. It also represents a genealogical backbone, with each star representing a generation. The star line starts with the North Star, connects down to the Seven, which is what they call the Big Dipper, and Spica, and these are the two stars in the middle of the line. So Hokulea, which is the star of gladness, um, right in the middle of the line there, is a zenith star, Hawaii, meaning it will be directly overhead when you are at the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. Hokulea is very important to navigators on finding their way back to Hawaii. So there's one of your star lines up there off of the seven. And next to um, uh, Canalia is Me'e, which is a combination of four stars that create a box. You see it down there. Uh, where it says the, the voice of joy. And that connects with the Southern Cross. There's Hokulea. There is the, uh, the connection with, between the box and the uh, Southern Cross. That's your other pointer, your Southern pointer. There's the Manakalanili, which is the chief's fish line. And this refers to the legend of the demigod Maui and his magical fish hook would use to pull islands up from the sea. So this line consists of the navigator's triangle, which we call a summer triangle, that's modern astronomers, which connects Deneb there with Vega and Altair, those three stars there. It's um, the Polynesian triangle, and it represents Hawaii, Rapa Nui, and uh, Atoaroa, uh, three islands which were pulled out of the sea by Maui. And the northern pointer is found in the navigator's triangle when you connect uh, Hawaii, which is Deneb and Sadr there. And the other one down the other end <coughs> with the cheese fish line is if you connect to Shuba and Nur using the Arab names. The last one is the Kaida of Coelho, Calupio Coelho, who is a great chief of Kauai and Oahu. And this star line represents the kite that he lost as a child. So the star line starts with the chief frigate bird, which is the constellation Cassiopeia, that bent W. And it represents the Iwa bird, which is known for leading voyagers to land. The center of the star line is the kite of Coelho, which is the great square of Pegasus in, in the modern sky. And the four stars that make up the kite are named after Coelho's greatest ancestors. And the northern pointer is found there between the frigate bird and the corner of the kite. And the other one goes from the other corner of the kite over there towards the star, Omaha. So here's the Hawaiian summer sky. There's the navigator's triangle. There's the kite of Coelho. There's the um, backbone and the cheese fish line. You can see them all up there. That's the teapot that you see, they don't use that. But the cheese fish line, that's Scorpius. That's the scorpion. Here's the winter sky. There's Orion. It's a cat's cradle here. And there is the Hyades and the Pleiades. Now, the Tongan sky is also navigational, but a star may have multiple names if the star is part of numerous star paths or if it's depending on the island group that it originates from. They did not have a name for Polaris, oddly enough. And the constellation Scorpio are also absent. I mean, just about every one of the cultures I'm going to show you has 
a version of the scorpion in it, and they don't. We don't know why, but it's an interesting anomaly. And the common ancestry of uh, Polynesian star lore is evident in the similarities of the naming of stars. For example, the Pleiades is called Mataliki in Tongan, Matariki in Hawaii, and in Amari, and Makali'i in Hawaii. So there's the Tongan sky. Okay, so you've got a um, string of fish, which is the belt and sword of Orion. You've got the belt of Orion is considered to be a wild duck. The head of Taurus, the Hyades cluster, is a pigeon purse, perch. And uh, they have their own names for Rigel and Betelgeuse, so some of the brightest stars in the constellation of Orion and, and in Sirius. So there's Orion. And there's the pigeon perch, which is a Hyades cluster. Here's the winter sky. You can see, you know, you've got the southern wild duck cloud at Wolvea, all kinds of interesting things. In Vana, uh, Vanuatu, which is another uh, Polynesian culture, you can see they've got all kinds of different things that they've taken Orion down into. The belt is a long yoke. The Orion sword is a short yoke. Orion's body is a fan. Um, they've got all kinds of things that are related to their culture. So there you see Orion, the short yoke and the long yoke. And you can see the Hyades, that triangular thing has become tweezers for hot stones, which is what they use. And the Pleiades is young boys or young girls from one of their islands. There's the winter sky. You can see the Southern Cross is the four roads. And the name that they have for the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds, which you can't see from our latitude, but you certainly can see from there, are the Earth ovens. You see them down there in the lower part of slide. There is another wrap. <laughs> okay, let's go over to the other side of the Pacific and let's look at Aztec stuff. They use the night skies and star movements for their calendars and the measurement of both agricultural and sacred cycles. And a great part of this knowledge was lost as a consequence of the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. But indigenous peoples and some Spanish priests preserved colonial codices, which incorporated descriptive texts both in Spanish and Nahuatl. So we do know some of their constellations. There is Orion's belt, which is two sticks used to light the new fire in the commemoration celebrated every 52 years, coinciding with the beginning of the new year. The Pleiades is the market because they saw it as a circle of goods with somebody standing inside. And Gemini, the twins, is the ball game of the stars. So here you see summer sky. There's the teapot. Don't use it, but yes, they use the scorpion. See, you've got a twisted foot over there. There is the Aztec winter sky. I'm going to zoom in on this. There's the ball game of the stars, which is what we would call Gemini now. There is Orion, which has become the two sticks that you rub together to create the fire. And there is the market. Now, the Mayan uh, codices were thought to have been taken to Europe by the first explorers of the New World as evidence of their discoveries. And the Paris Codex, in particular, was then long forgotten until a priest, Leon Rosny, found it in 1859 in a chimney corner where it was rotting away. It had suffered substantial damage. But despite this, the Paris Codex describes asterisms and constellations seen by the Mayas, some of them probably related to a group of zodiacal constellations, others not. So there is a Mayan sky, and there is the teapot, but it's a snake here. <coughs> oh, and next to it, you can see they've got a scorpion. It's a very, very common thing. Here's the winter sky, there, is Orion. It's become a turtle in the primordial fire. And there is the Hyades, which is an owl in this culture. There's the Tupi Guarani tribe, which is basically in the area of Brazil. We know from the book um, written in 1614, published in Paris, that the Tupi people identified some 30 constellations, but unfortunately, they only bothered to describe seven of them in this book. So the two principal ones, the winter sky is dominated by the white ostrich. In the first two weeks of June, this constellation is fully visible in the eastern sky in the evening, indicating the beginning of winter. 
in the south of Brazil and the start of the dry season in the north. And the summer sky is dominated by the homem velo, which is the old man, which depicts an old man holding a stick. And in the second half of December, the constellation is fully visible in the eastern sky and marks the beginning of summer in the southern parts of Brazil and start of the rainy season in the north. So there's the old man. There's what we call Orion. But you see, that's just become his lower legs. And he's got a stick. And the Hyades cluster has become his triangular head. And the Pleiades is a feather in his cap. Interesting. There's the winter sky. There's the white ostrich. There's the teapot. They don't use it, but part of the white ostrich is the scorpion. There's the Tucano from, the, from Guiana, and they have used all kinds of different parts of the same sky in a different way. You've got a handle, uh, an as handle, which is Orion's belt. You've got, um, all, well, I'll show you. Here you go. Take a look at this. All right, so you've got a Cardian shrimp. You've got a kind of fish. There is both the teapot and the scorpion turned into a snake. There is Orion. It's become an as handle, which is a tool that they would have used. And the Hyades has become a kind of grill to cook fish. And the Pleiades is just a group of stars. So let's go to Australia. What are they doing down there? Well, 140 years ago, a Burong family at Lake Tyrell, which is in northwestern Victoria, Australia, told William Stanbridge their stories relating to the night sky. There was some 40 stars, constellations, and other celestial phenomena which were named and located. He wrote them down and he gave them to the Philosophical Institute in Melbourne in 1857. And in his paper, he wrote down the Aboriginal term and gave its European equivalent. They were described as being very prideful of their astronomical knowledge. So there you go. There is their sky. And you can see there's the teapot, again, not using it, but there's what a lot of cultures is a scorpion is a red rough parrot here. And here's the summer sky. There is the teenage boys and the female eagle, the wife of Warapil, which we would call Orion. There's a, a pink cockatoo, that's the Hyades cluster, and the Pleiades is pearls. Let's look at the Camillaride people. And they are from New South Wales, and they've survived, survived European invasion and loss of much of their country. And their culture and connection to country remains strong, including extensive cultural astronomy, which was first recorded in the 1860s. So there's the Camillaroi sky. You can see they've got uh, all kinds of whales and, uh, that are, and, and animals and things that are uh, known to the culture, but also some historical figures like old Oregon there. And here's the summer sky and there's Orion and there is the Hyades cluster and there is the Pleiades. Um, the all new people of Northern Australia, they this is their version of Orion. I haven't generated an entire view of the sky for them, but that's Orion and Orion has become a boat. And the three stars in the belt are the seat in the middle of the boat and you see the sword it's a fish line with a fish on the end of it. All right, let's go to Asian part of the world. Remember I told you about asterisms? They only use asterisms, no constellations at all in their Xinguans. The number varies through different eras in Chinese history. Xinguans near the Southern Celestial Pole were created following the introduction of Western constellations into China by Catholic missionaries. And the one I'm going to show you has 300 Xinguans. They have since been edged out by Western constellations. Modern um, Asian scientists use the, the standard ones that are recognized by the International Astronomical Union. So there is the Chinese sky. Look at that. You know, people go, oh God, they have to memorize 48 constellations. Try memorizing that. There is the teapot. <coughs> Become the dipper and the winnowing basket. And there's the brightest star in the sky there, Vega. Here is the winter sky. There's Orion. 
there's the Hyades, there's the Pleiades. But look at all of this stuff, all these different constellations. It's remarkable. Now, Japanese astronomy is complex. They have what is called Seishuku, or celestial palaces, or lunar lodges, each associated with a talismanic animal. Seishuku were used to determine the position of sun and planets as well as the moon. And the talismanic animals with their associated Seishuku probably related to the direction of the handle of the Big Dipper, which they call the North Seven Stars, and they do in other Asian cultures, which pointed at the equinoxes and solstices. Before the common era, when the Seishuku were created, the Big Dipper did not appear to set because it had a relatively higher position than it did now. Remember I told you, these stars, they move. They also had moon stations. And most astronomical observation in Japan until the Meiji Restoration was closely tied to astrology. So I'm not going to show you um, their asterisms. I'm just going to show you the moon stations. It's just a little bit easier. There's the Orion, which is a turtle snout and the investigator. And there's the Hyades, it's a net. And there's the stopping place, which is the Pleiades. Summer sky. There's the teapot with the dipper and the basket. There's that map of the Korean sky I told you about earlier. This um, first, these first appear in the records of the Grand Historian, the Han Dynasty, of the, or, uh, describing the Jia Dynasty in about 2000 BCE. They have 272 asterisms, actually, have constellations here. They're based on the Korean constellation map, which was carved on stone in 1395. But it has its origin from another sky map, which existed about 2,000 years earlier. It represents 1,467 stars and about 190 constellations whose shapes are slightly different from the Chinese ones. And it's so old that only about 300 stars still match the stars we see in the sky. So there is the Korean asterism. And it is very similar to the Chinese. There's Orion. There's the Hyades. There's the Pleiades. And over here, there's the teapot. So now let's go way north. Let's look at an Inuit sky. I picked this picture deliberately because it's got pictures of the stars I'm going to talk about here. They have the top part of Orion is called the two placed far apart. I'll show you this in a minute. They have the runners, which is the belt of Orion. They have the spirit of a polar bear, which is the Hyades. They have the breastbone, or some Arctic First Nations call this the baying dogs. So that's the Pleiades. <coughs> the star Sirius is flickering. There is uh, the, the spirit of a holy bear, the, the Hyades. And there's a the Pleiades, right above the igloo there. So here is what their sky looks like. See, there is um, caribou. There's the old man, the two in front. There's uh, the one behind, if you look in the top corner there, and you see um, if we zoom into a part of the sky there, there is Orion. So you see the top two stars become two, pla uh, two placed far apart, and the runners of the three stars of the belt. There's the spirit of a polar bear, which is the Hyades, and there's the breastbone, which is the Pleiades. Now, there is no summer sky because <laughs> the sun doesn't go down. So we're not going to waste our time with that. The Norse people, it's very interesting, despite a, a rich oral and written tradition, very little has been preserved in Norse star names and constellations. There's two major problems, the use of Latin and Greek Roman names during the medieval period, and the romanticism in the 19th century where new names and traditions arose. And even today, the New Age movement invents new names and traditions. So our main source of North mythology comes from the poetic Edda and the Prosaic. This is uh, Snorri Sturluson's Edda. But there exist other sources with surprisingly few references to this guy, considering that these guys were master navigators. You know, I mean, they were up there in their ships and on, all over the world. So well, this indicates a fair knowledge of astronomy for navigation. We know they used local landmarks in combination with observations to tell the time. They were aware of the difference of sun time and star time. The existence of a Norse calendar is mentioned as part of a calendar reformed in the Icelandic Chronicle at 995 CE. And this calendar was used from the 8th to the 12th century when it was replaced by our 
Julian calendar. So the ones that we do know about is the Fisherman, which is Orion's belt, which is also known as Frank's distaff. And there's Ulf's Kepter, which is the mouth of the wolf, the Hyades. The Norse mythology was that there were two wolves hunting the sun and the moon, and the mouth of the wolf is close to the ecliptic. So you can imagine that's how they came up with that. So there isn't a lot in this sky here, and I've, but you see that the Big Dipper is a man's cart, and the Little Dipper has become the women's cart. There's the Asar battlefield. There's the wolf's mouth, and the, there's the fisherman down there, Orion. There's the wolf's mouth, which is the Hyades. The Sami people, Norway, Sweden, Finland, they have a, a quite different sky. They've got the elk, Sarva. His main constellation takes up parts of three of our constellations. You've got the hunter, Fafna. You've got the Big Dipper, which is the Fauna Davke. You've got the Bojan Hospital, which is the sky support, the star Polaris. And you've got Gala, which is the star Procyon, and his sons, the Gala Barnek, which is Orion's belt. The ski runners, Castor and Pollux, and the runner, which is that bright star Vega, which are Fabna's helpers. And the Pleiades is a dog pack, or in some parts of the north, the calf pack. And the Milky Way is known as the bird path with the year mark. So here is their sky. See, there is Orion, Gala's sons, three stars in the belt. There is the pack of dogs, which is the Pleiades. You see Sarva the elk right in the middle there, which the, the antlers is the, the bent W of Cassiopeia. There's Favna, that's the Big Dipper. And the story is he has to be very careful in shooting his arrow at the elk because if he hits the sky support, the sky's going to fall down. Okay, now let's tell you the ancient skies is passed on to me by the elders of First Nations. And we're going to start with Ojibwe. And one of my favorites from theirs is the Winter Maker. I'll show him to you in a minute. Then there's Mishi Bisu, the curly tail, the great panther, a big spirit cat that lives at the bottom of lakes and caused flooding a water danger. When the great cat was overhead, the lakes would not be frozen and would be dangerous to cross. And Oji, the fisher, able to trick the ogres and free the birds, saving everyone with his courage and wit. Fisher is not diurnal or nocturnal, but prefers always to be on the move, eating and sleeping night and day. He does not build a home in one place and return as most animals do, but rather makes its home in different places. And then you've got Ma'an, which is the loon, very important messenger and clan leader. The loon stands at the doorway between the water and the land or the material and the spirit world. So here is the Ojibwe sky. And there is the winter maker. And you see they've taken Orion and expanded it and made it a giant. And over here, the Pleiades is the Bugona Gizeg, which is the hole in the sky. And there you see the loon and Oshig the fisher, and you see the moose and the crane. There's the summer sky. Now, Lakota and Dakota, I put this image in here specifically because part of Orion is going to turn into be a hand. You will see what I mean in a minute. So you've got the Spirits Road, which is the Milky Way. You've got the, the hand, Nape, which is the Orion's belt and sword and the stars of Rigel and Eridanus Beta. You've got the racetrack, which is subdivided into the sacred hoop and the animal's backbone. And you've got the seven little girls, which is the Pleiades, and the snake. So here you go. There, you see in the middle there, the sacred hoop. There is Orion, which has become a hand with fingers pointing down. There's the buffalo crumbrail, which is the Hyades cluster, there's the seven girls, which is the Pleiades. We give you a picture so you can better see what they're actually looking at there. That's what it looks like. Summer sky, you got the Thunderbird, you've got the Blue Birth Woman, which is the Big Dipper. You've got the Salamander, the turtle. Now the Navajo call the Pleiades Dilyehe, which means pin like sparkles. Dilyehe is a constellation of time keeping and planting for the Navajo people who have a saying, don't let Dilyehe see you plant your seeds. This comet refers to the Pleiades disappearing setting in early May and reappearing in late June or early July. 
Other Navajo stories of Gilead tell of seven mischievous young boys who follow the ones who plant too late and snatch the seeds out of the ground. Then you got Atse Etsosi, which is the first slim one. This is what they call Orion. He's a young warrior carrying a bow and arrow. And like Gilead, his constellation is related to planting and is seen every season except for part of the summer. Then you got Atse Etsosi. He's often spoken of as the son-in-law to Atse Eso, which includes part of the constellation of Scorpius. In accordance with Navajo tradition of mother-in-laws and son-in-laws not ever meeting or speaking, Atse Eso and Atse Eso are never seen in the sky at the same time. So there's the Navajo sky. And you see, there is what we call Orion. They call it the first slim one. And you notice here, there's Dilyehe in light sparkles. But here, there is what we call the Big Dipper. It's the revolving male. And over here, we have a revolving female. And the two of them revolve around the North Star, which is the hearth fire. And there is the Navajo summer sky. We have the first big one. And there's the revolving male and female again, and the lizard. Now, I want to tell you a quick story. The Royal Astronomical Society got together with the Mi'kmaq people um, they have a lunar calendar, which you see depicted here, <clears throat> but they had forgotten how to use it. Well, I mean, the residential schools have done an excellent job of trying to erase knowledge of that sort of stuff. So what we did is we sat down with their elders, the Halifax members, and they told us their stories of the sky. And there was a recurring theme, which is a great white moon in winter, and we realized pretty quickly, being astronomers, that we're talking about the moon at its closest approach at uh, perigee. And we realized that what they were saying in these stories is that every time the moon did that, if you took this extra piece of few days and you insert it into the calendar, that would bring the lunar calendar back into synchronization with the solar one. And we, they recovered the calendar. And now our members and their Elders go out and do presentations on their sky. We're pretty happy about that. The society actually will sell you an Ojibwe sky star map and constellation guide and a planisphere with disks showing our sky, but also four different native skies. So if you're really interested, go to the RESC website, resc.ca, and you can get one of these for yourself. Now, everybody know who this is? Anybody not recognize Hagrid and this dragon here? Why the heck am I showing you Hagrid and this dragon? There's an interesting thing. In the sky, you've got all kinds of different structures of star, stars. There are all kinds of open clusters, and some of them resemble things. People will look at them and say, gee, that looks like a bird or a boat or whatever. But over time, the names change. This is New General Catalog 2301, which is an open cluster in the constellation Monoceros. It was originally called Copeland's Golden Worm. And then it became the Seabird Cluster. And honestly, I don't think that looks like a seabird. It doesn't. But then we got some astronomers who happened to be fans of J.K. Rowling. And somebody looked at that and went, that's Hagrid's dragon. <laughs> so that's now, what a lot of people call this star cluster. You can see it for yourself with 7x50 binoculars quite easily. It was actually first discovered by William Herschel in 1786. It's got a whole bunch of beautiful different colored stars in it. It's, if you want to find it, go to Orion. There's Orion there. Take Betelgeuse and the top star and draw a line right down in the pinchers and Monoceros. right there. It's quite easy to see. How about the Golden Snitch? Yep, same thing happened. NGC 7380. The Wizard Nebula originally. Now we've got a lot of people calling it Harry Potter and the Golden Snitch. This was first discovered by Carolyn Herschel, who is William's sister, but a very accomplished astronomer in 1787. This is a little more difficult to vi observe visually. You pretty much need a telescope with a, an O3 filter, which kind of makes the, the thing pop out by only letting certain frequencies get through. But if you want to see this, come up to the observatory when we open again, I'll, I'll show it to you. It's a, a beautiful cluster about 7,200 light years away. And to find that, there's Cassiopeia, the bent W. You take the middle star, draw a line across, draw a line through the constellation Lacerta, and it kind of seems right into the middle of the Milky Way where you're going to find this. 
Okay. What was the point of me telling you all this stuff? I mean, nowadays people look up at light polluted skies and two thirds of the world's population and only see a handful of first magnitude stars and maybe some planets without even realizing they are planets. And what their perspective is basically is, is the artificial light reflecting off of glass and concrete and steel where our ancient ancestors looked up and looked out to the edge of the observable universe. These four people here all have something in common. They looked up at that sky that everyone had decided this is what you're looking at. And they all said, no, I see something different. And they all changed our perspectives and science and how everything was done. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that old white guys are have a monopoly on this. There are plenty of female astronomers out there who are equally uh, capable, who have done the same thing. You know, this is the very short list of some here, but you know, there are all kinds of examples of this. So what am I telling you to do? Remember we were looking at this and we decided, yeah, that's not a bear. I want you to go out and I don't want you to look into the sky to see what the ancient ancestors saw. I want you to go out in the sky and explore and see what you see there. And then you can pass on all, to all the rest of us your experiences and maybe you'll be the next person to rename one of those open star clusters. And yeah, you know, I, I really do think this is a rat. I do, must be true. So if you have any questions and, and we're done the meeting, you can get a hold of me at info at coastastronomy.ca. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, Charles. Yeah. <clears throat> Can, can astronomers rewind the stars back, you know, or whatever thousand years or 50,000 years? You can, um, because so much effort has been put into determining what the velocities of stars are. If you've got a big enough computer and a lot of uh, computing time, you can you can do like you saw in that time exposure that I, I showed at the very front of the presentation. You can run through things through and you can see where all of these stars are going. Like we know, for example, that the Pleiades is heading, cruising in the direction of Orion's feet right now, you know. So um, yes, that, that is something you can do. I should mention all of the slides that I created for the presentation today were created on a free open uh, source program that you can download yourself. It's called Stellarium. It shows you the night sky as viewed from any point on the face of the Earth at any time of day, or the surface of the Moon, or the surface of Mars, there's all kinds of other possibilities. And you can go into the sky culture section and you can tell it to show you all of these different skies that I just showed you so you can explore <clears throat> these constellations for yourself. Charles, do you know if the uh, Coast Salish had a, an astronomy? It's interesting, you know, we have had several members who have been um, trying to make connections with the local um, seashell nation to, to, to try and figure out what their sky was. And because of their experiences with the residential school, it was very difficult to try and uh, build up the trust to do that. Now, actually, what I did in the end is I got my friend uh, Shelley Rabinovich, who's a PhD at the University of um, Ottawa to come out and join me and we went to speak to one of the elders and they were being very polite but there was this wall until Shelly pulled out her medicine bag and dropped it on the counter because she's Cree. They went, oh, okay. And the truth is a lot of it has been lost just like it was for say the Aztec or the, or the Mayas. But I do know that for example, the Big Dipper is the seven brothers and each of those brothers represents one of their clans. So you know, they had this guy, obviously they were navigators too. And I'm hoping um, as time goes on, we'll be able to recover some more of this stuff and, and do something like the Halifax Center did. Charles, it's Alexis. We have a question in the chat. Yeah. 
And that question is, um, is the reason the Tongans didn't have a name for Polaris, was it because they were too far south to see it? Um, some of the uh, nations in the southern hemisphere, like the Australian uh, indigenous people, would have had that problem. And, and probably uh, the Tongans had an issue like that, but the Hawaiians didn't. I mean, it was very low in the sky and, and the Big Dipper rose and set, but it was there and they, they could see it. So, uh, and of course, if you're way south, you're not using, uh, what you're using is the Southern Cross, prob probably is the principal uh, navigational tool if you're not familiar with the, the other sky systems that are out there. But um, this is one of the interesting things. I I've been out there teaching on cruise ships and so on and in and, and various different parts of the world. And, and it, I, it takes me a few minutes to try and orient myself to the sky because I'm used to being at 49 you know, latitude and seeing things a certain distance above the horizon and suddenly they're way up there or they're right off you know, the map and there's something else up there. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see if I have a, a pen pal right now who uh, we just sent a telescope to in, in uh, Uganda, Harry Andinda, who is hoping to become a, an astrophysicist. And uh, I was looking at his guy from, you know, um, his part of the world. And, and it, again, yeah, it takes me a minute to orient myself because everything is quite a bit higher in the sky than what I'm used to seeing. And it's, it's a different perspective altogether. <clears throat> Any more questions? Sheila. Okay, well, again, if you think of something later, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be happy to answer or give us a call at the, the center. I hope that once we get everyone vaccinated, we'll be able to bring you up to the observatory and show you some of these things uh, ourselves. <clears throat> if you're interested in joining the society, the, go to the RESC website. Uh, it's actually going to be vastly improved and we're, we're uploading a whole new system on the 18th of this month. So it might be better to wait until after the 18th. You get a free Sky subscription to Sky News Magazine. You get the Observer's Handbook, which is everything you ever want to know about what's going on in the sky. And you get all kinds of crazy uh, people like me that can answer your questions and, and help you make your way through the sky and not get lost in all those stars up there. Hey, Charles, have you talked with anybody from Heidi Gwai about their position? Heidi Gwai, I haven't, but I, I oh. hope to. I mean, I'm gradually expanding my list of ancient skies, and, and I'm hoping that I can get some from them. I have been up north to Whitehorse and talked to some of the uh, First Nations people up there that deal with the Yukon Center. But of course, like I said, they they have an interesting issue with their sky because they only have it for part of the year, you know, and they have all kinds of things that we don't regularly experience down here, like the aurora borealis, you know. And there's all kinds of myths and things that are related to that. So, because they used to raid the Sunshine Coast quite regularly, they did. <laughs> they did. So, I, you know, you know for a fact that they knew about celestial navigation because they were obviously very capable seagoing people. But, you know, it's it's part of the problem when you're dealing with cultures that don't have um, written records and have been, you know, victimized by people who are trying to erase these cultures. But we're, we're working on it. You know, we, we've got all kinds of uh, different centers across Canada that are gradually building back these relationships and trying to recover this stuff because, uh, you know, it's, it's, you ask anybody in, in um, astrophysics, the, the best situation you can have is a bunch of people getting together from all kinds of different cultures because the, their perspectives will help you see things that you don't see in the sky. That's how you discover stuff is by thinking outside of the box and that, that helps you to do that. Diversity always improves the, the productivity every single time. <clears throat> Sheila, did you have a question? Yes, yes, I do. Um, Charles, who were the other three men in uh, with uh, Einstein in that slide? You had Copernicus, you had Galileo, you had Newton, and you uh, had Einstein. All right. Um, 
you had on the other slide, you had Annie Jump Cannon, who was the woman who classified stars by their temperature with, uh, with colors and, and stuff. So we know our star is a G-class star. She was the one that came up with that. Quite a remarkable woman. She was deaf. Oh. And originally, all the credit was taken by um, her uh, supervisor, who was a male scientist at, at uh, Harvard. But eventually they said, yeah, that wasn't your work. And um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of, of uh, women out there who have done amazing things. I was talking about Carolyn Herschel. You know, we, everyone hears about William Herschel, but half of the stuff that was in the, the star catalog that he created that became the new general catalog that we all use today was discovered by Caroline. She was very, okay. very good. All right. Thank you. I see someone's put a link in the chat for the stellarium.org if you're interested in getting a download. Go look at the sky yourself. So thank you all for your uh, attention. I, and I'm going, I have recorded this. And what I want to do is uh, process it um, and put some title stuff in it. And we'll put it on the YouTube website for our astronomy club so you can all see it again if you need to.